Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar. We are today going to be talking about rethinking pedagogy for blended learning. You'll hear very little from me today because I've got such an amazing panel of speakers that I'm going to let them do all the talking. So without any further ado, I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves, starting with you, Al. Well, hi there. I'm Al Kingsley. Um, I'm Group CEO of NetSupport, but I'm also chair of a number of multi-academy trusts in the east of England. Jim. Uh, hello, my name is Jim Knight, aka Lord Knight of Weymouth. And as the name suggests, uh, I'm a recovering politician in the House of Lords. I was once a schools minister for England for three years. And I now spend my time thinking about digital education um, policy and advising various people around ed tech. Michael. Uh, Michael Flood. Uh, I'm a senior vice president and the general manager for the education division at Khajiit. Um, we're focused on connecting students to broadband when they're not in school, particularly timely. Thank you. Miriam. Hello, everyone. I'm Miriam Manderson. I'm a secondary school head teacher in Harrow in the UK, and I'm passionate about reversing the effects of disadvantage and also passionate, passionate about the use of digital technologies. And last but not least, Peter. Thank you, Sarah. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Peter Ashworth, and I'm the chief exec of a uh, multi-academy trust based in the northwest of England. Uh, I've had the pleasure to be the CEO of my trust for five years, and we have 10 academies, and I completely agree with everything Miriam just closed out her opening comments with. Thanks so much, guys. So in this session, we're looking at approaches to teaching and learning, how we're doing things in the classroom and what we need to shape or change. This is a very interactive session, so I'd really encourage you to answer, ask questions. But to start with, um, a quick question to you in the audience. How advanced is your current digital strategy? And to you, our presenters, my first question to you all is where and how are children learning now? So who would like to start us off? I'm happy to start as secondary. I'm, I think I'm fresh off the hot off the press with regards to teaching, uh, teaching and learning in schools. Well, currently we're pleased to be educating our students back on site, um, but we have embraced that we now have more of a blended approach where it needs to be. So we do have students using digital technology at home in a much more efficient and effective way than ever before. So we have a blended approach and work, for example, is predominantly set, monitored, tracked and engaged with online as well as outside with a blended approach with lessons in school. We have a number of students, for example, who have been um, say stranded abroad, <laughs> unable to return after their lovely Easter holidays. And we are really pleased that if we need to, we can engage them with digital lessons, recorded lessons, and if need to be, even live lessons as well. So in my, from my perspective, students are learning both on site now, but have the opportunity to learn in the comfort of their homes, if they have that, or in an alternative place, accessing the provision that's there for every child that we cater to. And Sarah, if I may, I, I would say, of course, <laughs> children are born learning and they're always learning and they're learning at home and at school and wherever. The difference is where they're doing their formal learning, I guess, where you know, Miriam gave the perfect answer. Um, uh, you know, and that's what we hope from every school is that because, you know, you know I, I spoke to the deputy heads of the primary schools in Somerset yesterday and they were saying pretty much by and large, that they've had the, the laptops for the free school meals kids, for the people premium kids, um, that that's a game changer for them in terms of properly being able to embed the use of technology and, and being able to you know, get some of the workflow gains, the, the, the workload gains that, that, that they've been able to get by finding some good products that really work well for them and confident now that, that pretty much all of their children can access um, learning at home. We should be conscious that there are still around 6% of families who don't have access at home to online technology, um, that there's still around 20% of children who haven't got reliable access because they're competing for devices and the device, the main device still might be, might be mobile. So there's still some work to be done on that. And we should also be conscious 
that on the last measure which, yeah, that I saw from last week, one in 30 children are currently off school because of COVID uh, self-isolation. And so what Miriam was talking about in terms of that blend, um, I think we will definitely see through the rest of this term. And I know that pretty much every school leader is now anxiously thinking about what their plan for September it really should be looking like. I think Jim's point and Miriam there really resonate. I think the other thing is kind of holding the flag up, reflecting from our trust perspective. I think we're still on a bit of a learning journey, figuring out which things actually had impact uh, and we and, and ways to measure that. And, and of course, the timeline, particularly for secondaries, the last few weeks, months, has been focused on lots of other priorities in terms of CAGs and other aspects that are going through. But we're looking at that provision in terms of that interventions and personalised learning for some of our students. So I think there's a bit of an evolution and, you know, and, and it's, it's obviously good to hear from, from trust leads. But I, I think anybody who says we've, we've got it perfectly sewn up and we know exactly what, we, what the future looks like, I think there's a few steps still of evolution before we get there. So if I, if I could follow on from uh, the three colleagues uh, in, in total agreement, Al, with what you just said, I think... I think there's been an evolution from where we thought we were to where we really were. So I think if we'd asked this question prior to COVID, we'd probably been quite bullish and said, yes, we've got a mature digital strategy because by definition, we, we have our pupils inside our four walls for a great majority of the time. I agree with where, where Jim was heading in terms of it's recognising that difference between formal learning and what you might class as, you know, uh, experiential learning, intrinsic learning. Uh, and I think for us, it's shown that, that actually children are really resilient to trying to seek out digital app routes into their learning. You, you certainly had experience of, you know, parental or parent care or mobile phones being hijacked to access the internet, you know, perfectly legitimately, because that was the only device. Uh, or one device in a household with up to four learners and how do you ration that going forwards? So I think I think we recognise that the children will always seek out avenues to learn and I think as we craft where this goes next in a hybrid world, we, we don't we don't want to lose sight of that. So I'll, I'll add a little bit of perspective uh, from our experience in the United States, but uh, I agree with everything that everyone has said. I mean, certainly children are, are active learners all the time. So I would expand the question of not just where they're learning, but when they're learning. And uh, you know, for 10 years prior to the pandemic, uh, Khajiit's focus over here was on what the US was calling the homework gap, uh, which was that some students would go home and have homework that required the use of the internet and some could do it and some couldn't because of that lack of access that, uh, that Lord Knight uh, mentioned earlier. So, um, so yes, you know, the students are learning uh, formally in school, uh, but even outside the pandemic, their ability to learn outside of school, um, you know, for homework or for informal uh, learning or for their own family directed educational opportunities. Um, you know, there can be uh, a lack of equity between those if they don't have access to the same technology. So we see students learning at school, at home, sitting in the bleachers at a football game, you know, or at an after school job, or if both their parents work, maybe they stay with a family member. You know, really, they're all over the place. And the ability for a student to be always connected for learning so that they can engage in their learning endeavors and practice wherever they are and whenever they have the opportunity to do so, uh, I think that's something we all strive to achieve to maximize the opportunity for our children. Thank you very much. So sort of recognizing children are a little more self-directed, perhaps, and seeking out ways to learn all the time. I suppose my, my question to you and what have been your experiences, how should we change the way we teach? That's really lots of examples of that. Uh, we'd love to hear what you're thinking. Well, I can jump in. I'll start this one and, and then we'll go maybe in the reverse order, but I'll, I'll jump in. Go first. Peter, go ahead. Michael, go ahead. Sorry, Michael. Go oh, ahead. Michael. Oh, okay. Sure. So. Sorry. So I, ha I have a very relevant current example, and I'll give you another example from one of our deployments before as well. So, um, you know, the current example, I was just reading a story here about this recent Supreme Court decision in the U.S. Um, that was around free speech rights for a, a high school student, you know, versus her school. And, uh, you know, reading about how um, teachers who are teaching, uh, you know, current affairs and social studies and, and law and policy were actively engaging their students in this case while it was, um, you know, going throughout the school year. 
um, and getting their students to read precedents and research and like and debate online with each other. And these were all students who were remote, you know, who weren't in their schools at the time. Um, and then being able to write up their own decision before the Supreme Court issued theirs. So the ability to engage with something that's a very much a current event like that, um, you know, in real time as things are happening was was something that they couldn't get from a textbook. Um, they couldn't get from a prepared, um, you know, lesson plan. It, this was really a real time interaction that was in the moment, but it was very engaging for those students because it had all the wonders of, you know, teen drama and <laughs> everything else going on at the same time. Um, and a similar example from one of our deployments in Chicago, where uh, students had been equipped with uh, with computers is the first time they'd had computers in their homes. These were low income uh, families. Um, you know, the, the previous method for teaching a unit on Alaska uh, was that every student had a paragraph, two paragraphs on Alaska in their textbook, and they would all read those two paragraphs and they were required to be able to regurgitate those two paragraphs on a test later. And so it was a very small, you know, amount of knowledge and everyone was exactly the same. Um, and when once the teachers were able to adapt their learning practice to the available av availability of the technology, instead they asked the class of 30 students to each go prepare their own report on Alaska using their own research. And visual learners were going down the route of wildlife photography and maps and you know all those sort of things. Uh, very statistical learners were going to census and economic data. But each student then presented their view of what they had learned about Alaska to the rest of the class. So the entire class got 30 unique perspectives on Alaska that were far more in depth and drove greater retention of information as well than just the two paragraphs in the textbook. So I think changing the way we teach uh, when we're enabled by technology is really fundamental. I'd like to jump in there, uh, Sarah, if that's okay. Thank you, Michael. A few things resonated with me and I think I've been thinking about this. We all know that in the pandemic, schools had to race to become digitally literate. And I've always felt passionate about students being developed in terms of their literacy, but in terms of being digitally literate. And in my school in particular, I have a journey where I've always been passionate about what we did. I came from a school that had Apple Macintosh. And then I went to a school which was a Google school. And I ended up at this school, which had a whole mixture, should we say. It wasn't where it needed to be. <laughs> Um, and we decided to go with the Microsoft platform, and I went with that for one particular reason, which was familiarity with the wide range of staff. But the, the key thing there was it did change the way lessons were delivered. And I saw some beautiful examples. My deputy head and I decided to go for what we call the digital learning walk. We wanted to see what was going on across every lesson in every curriculum area through the digital forum. And we saw some really interesting examples of live, real-time assessment for learning taking place. And I think whilst you can do that in a live setting in the classroom, it was amazing to see the students either putting things in the chat, where you would open up the avenue for the quiet student in the classroom, actually, who would have more focus on delivering their thoughts and their processes through words in the chat. You would also have the examples where teachers and students would instantly be able to share work that they've done online visibly. So you'd have that going on. Um, and it's just this idea of being instant with what you could do and deliver if you develop the, the confidence with using the technology. And so we were able to share that practice of how teachers were changing what they do in the classroom, transforming how they were doing things to the screen. And it was fascinating. And the beauty of that was they were recorded. So you can always go back and you can see and the students have instant replay. So they can hear the misconceptions that have been explained again and reiterated to them from the horse's mouth, from the teacher's mouth, without having to think, oh, what did Miss say again? What did Sir say? You know, they weren't too far away from it. And I think it has transformed how things are done there. But the danger was everything was on the screen. So we had a moment where we thought, right, we're going to have a digital detox. And for this week, no homework will be done online. It will be set online, but you have to go and do things. Go to Sainsbury's and find 10 um, different versions of a French yogurt. I don't know, something with languages or something else. So, you know, it has really transformed how teachers engaged with the curriculum, how they deliver that. Yeah, I agree totally with that, Miriam. Sarah, if I could uh, jump in. I, without this sounding a lazy answer, I think some of the elements of uh, topic two are built on topic one, aren't they? You know, how, how do we change the way we teach? Well, it's understanding how our children learn, isn't it? And, and not just necessarily being obsessed with digital but thinking about the way that children are evolving in the way that they learn those opportunistic learning opportunities those planned formal opportunities uh, 
across our trust, we're, you know, we're a Google trust. It gave us some, you know, pre-preparedness with the use of things like Google Classroom. But I think, I think perhaps where we're going to go forwards from now is, is that blend, but perhaps take a leaf out of how our young people consume uh, media. If you, you know, you hear the phrase, you know, they like non-linear programming. They like to choose what they want to do, when they want to do. And actually, you know, the trick we mustn't lose is we've got the ability to archive lots of great physical teaching opportunities and have them there for replay, for study, for reflection, for, do you know what, I missed that in that bit of that lesson previously. I'm going to go back to that because our young people are disciplined in that, in, in the way that they search their own interests out on the internet to, to consume media. Uh, you know, the, there is no place for, the, there's no, you know, I don't see any immediate requirement to delete the physical aspect because that's, you know, how we as humans learn. But the ability to replay something that you thoroughly enjoyed or you didn't quite get is, is an advantage we're going to increasingly have going forwards. I think there's a building block on that actually as well, which is um, lots of these things we talk about, the digital and the broader kind of strategic approach. And, and we, got, we have to be mindful that, that's the facilitator to that core bit of how we want to deliver teaching and learning. Mm -hmm. uh, and what we have seen over the last 18 months is a lot more of that kind of focus about, it doesn't always follow the umbrella and sometimes it's by a response to, to, to need, but sometimes there's that strategic plan in terms of building that broader digital strategy. And I think what schools are looking at is first and foremost is identifying what your vision is and how it aligns with your school development plan and where you want to develop things. And then from that, it's not a race to who can do the most. There are, there are a couple of examples that, that I sometimes share that I thought might be relevant in terms of this dialogue. So uh, the Middle East, particularly the UAE, were a kind of ahead of the curve if we think back to 18 months ago in terms of reacting. And for some of the international schools there, one was uh, a dearer international school that were held up and, and recognized for their approach and strategy. And they very much break it down into these strands, which I think is much more accessible. So there's the digital comm side, but staff CPD, which I see resonated in the chat conversation just now, you know, building that confidence is kind of critical to everything else working. Then there's, as Miriam alluded to, the device strategy. Are you going for one or are you going to be flexible depending on the learning environment and the need at the time? Digital citizenship is huge because the more we empower people on, uh, you know, young people to be online, we want them to be critical thinkers themselves. And then the broader strand of educational technology. And then dovetailing the other end of that, if you've identified where you want to go and what you want to achieve, um, thinking across to, to Michael's side of the pond, um, Pickerington School District in Ohio, they were held up as being a really good exemplar about the process for actually choosing technology that works and that kind of sense of how do you build together the checklist of whether it's just simply a technical competence first and foremost, but are you going to evidence your technology just anecdotally or you know descriptively or are you going to actually correlate it against the impact that it makes and so i think there are layers here and, and often the narrative always comes back to uh, Oof, that sounds like a lot it's not mm -hmm. less is more it's actually about focusing on the things that you can actually measure and have that immediate impact but having a sense of looking ahead on on where we could take it potentially and uh, coming last there's not that much to add but i, I would say I'm struck that there aren't that many uh, school chains, let alone schools, that have a senior member of staff who is, a, if you like, the chief technical officer, the chief digital officer, who really, really understands the right procurement, who can really help advise on the right learning strategy around the deployment of technology, and who can also then ad advise on the right professional development, because you know, Michael posted up about the Samir model um, from Ruben Puentadora, uh, where, you know, which is pretty old these days, you know, it's been around 20 years or so, but um, in essence saying, and we saw this during the pandemic, if, you know, most teachers aren't trained, haven't been trained in how to use technology for teaching. So obviously what they're going to do, you, you know, why would they do any, anything different other than try and replicate the pedagogies that they use successfully face-to-face -face online? That is always going to be less good than pedagogies that are designed for the online environment and let alone the blended environment. So working out the right training in order to advance the, 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 the level of sophistication of ped pedagogy that finds the right blend for those particular children in that particular school, I think is important. And the final thing I'd say is then also finding the right blend between when you use technology and when you don't. 
with those deputy heads in Somerset yesterday, none of them, you know, they're all excited about the, what digital can now do for them. But when I asked them what they really wanted to keep, they wanted to keep the autonomy that they were given in the first lockdown to decide what to teach and the, the trust in them as professionals. They wanted to keep a focus and, a, and an understanding that less is more and that they were now more focused on a few things and doing them much better. And they wanted to keep forest schooling because that use of outside space and the use of the natural environment and so on in terms of helping them with well-being, and one school indeed had doubled the length of their playtime and found that it improved focus and concentration um, later on you know, during the day. Um, so sort of de-stressing about the amount of formal learning that has to happen and thinking more about children and their own development and uses of different spaces and different times for learning is all part of that blend that now we can reflect on as a result of this experience. Can I just add on to what Jim has just said? Because you, it, I was nodding profusely at everything you were saying there. Um, when I joined my school two years ago, I did. I alluded to the fact that the IT was in, in a particular state, let's just say. And the very first thing I thought about was we need a strategic leader of ICT. And we created a group called SLICT, Strategic Leadership of ICT. Um, and it meant employing or appointing somebody to have that strategic oversight and the confidence with which to direct the school digitally because that's the way we're going and you know we can't hide or shirk away from it and it just gave the staff the confidence there and I think you're absolutely right it's a gap that all schools really need to fill if they don't have that already amongst their teams. That's so interesting thank you very much and CPD has come up inevitably in in the in the chat here. So building very neatly on what you you have all been saying, do we have a skills gap, or do you in your settings have a skills gap, and how do we continue to support our teachers evolve their practice and and at the same time reduce their workload? Small topic. <laughs> Well, I have well, plenty to say on this topic, I think, but um, I'm, I'll let somebody else speak first if they want to. I'm going to say I'm going to, I was going to show my age and say didn't slipped used to be a formal qualification at the, the dawn of this century, uh, so it, it's it's always good to revisit something, Miriam. Uh, it's it's a really contentious question, isn't it? Is there a skills gap? Well, have we identified what skills may be deficit or surplus? Uh, I, I go back to exactly what uh, Lord Knight just said. I mean, we were always promised, weren't we, that IT and IT systems should be as instantaneous and ubiquitous as a pencil and we didn't need to skill people in the art of a pencil once they'd mastered basic uh, you know handwriting mastery i think I, th I think we have a workforce that has increasingly embraced digital not just because of the pandemic but because of the the efficiencies the ability to create better resources to have resources that are renewable and replaceable i think it's down to the type of pedagogy that we want to drive uh, you know, there, there is an absolute need that there's some digital downtime, that there's the ability to go and, and walk in a, you know, a forest school type environment to learn in that kind of environment and not take a device with you or to take a device with you to capture what's taking place. I think it's going to be driven by the culture that each uh, individual school or a trust with its family of schools develops. So I, I don't necessarily think there is a massive deficit culture out there. I think we give. I think we need to give people the re-permission uh, to follow what they're passionate about in teaching, and let the let the technology sometimes follow it or drive it. I don't know what other panelists think about that view. I really like that summary, Peter, and I, and I absolutely resonate wearing wearing you know hats on both sides of the coin. That absolutely, there's a refresh about technology. It's not about the most functionality. It's about accessibility and ease of use, and it's got to do what it says on the tin. I think when when the when the term skills gap gets presented, it's quite a negative term. And I think what that probably is fairer to say is at times with rapid introduction of change, there's a confidence gap, as you'd expect in any profession. And I think it's that sense of that continual, not only development, but actually providing awareness of solutions, approaches, methods, and, and that kind of bigger picture. And I think we've kind of we we highlighted over the <clears throat> excuse me, the last 18 months that sense of that rapid acquisition of knowledge or skills particularly around the use of technology and looking forwards it's about 
figuring out the elements that work well and how you actually embed that so that that, that new skills that are being acquired aren't lost through lack of regular use. And I think, again, that's not unique to the education sector. So I think we can perhaps frame it slightly more positive because we've, we've expected people to have an unreasonable amount of skills acquisition in terms of the technology over the last couple of years. And, and now it's about being selective in the things that are really purposeful and useful. And, uh, Sarah, uh, sorry, Miriam, do you want to go next? Shall I? Go on. <laughs> I was just going to say, I'd like to share, I mean, from my school's perspective, it's something you said earlier on, Jim. Teachers didn't train, well, if they're older than me, <laughs> certainly we're in my category, they didn't train to teach and deliver lessons online. And I would have to say that there was a skills gap and there was a culture shock. You know, the passion of honing your craft in the classroom was a bit scary when you suddenly had to transfer that to the screen, particularly if you were not familiar with the software. So there was a skills gap and there was the opportunity, though, with the pandemic to skill everybody up. And in our context, we didn't see it as a negative. In, 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 in fact, we saw it as a positive way to model to the students that we were learners, too. And we were going along with this digital transformation as they were. In fact, we, dis we discovered that if you have many people around as satellites, then you can expedite the professional development and the progress of those that don't have the confidence and that are sort of, you know, afraid to switch a computer on, afraid to click the click fear because something will go wrong. It's just about surrounding them with what we developed as super users, those that have the confidence and will hold the hand and say, it's okay, this is how you do it and this is what happens and giving them that confidence we had an extremely well developed professional development program in fact that's all we did we now want to return to the heart and soul of teaching and learning in the classroom because we feel that we've mastered that now well i should say we shouldn't know we haven't mastered it but we've certainly come a long way <laughs> there's more to do but we're definitely not where we were in 2019 when we all sort of fumbled around to try and get through the live lesson program to where we are now so, and our, my staff would happily say, we did have a skills deficit, but now we are very competent in doing what we need to do to make sure we meet the, need, need, meet the needs of the students online. So I think it's a really interesting question and there's more to do, but it's about the right time. And it's about, about surrounding people with the right people that can help them like that progress. I love the idea of modeling teachers, modeling that teachers are learners too. Well, we had to yeah. teach and staff, there you go. <laughs> Absolutely. And Sarah, Sarah, what I'd say to your question is I think rather than talking about a skills gap, there's a mindset gap at, mm -hmm. within the Department for Education, which is one which says we need to tell teachers how to teach, we need to prescribe everything, and we don't really trust them as professionals. <laughs> and wouldn't it be great if we could flip that mindset around and say, actually, if we treat teachers as professionals, what we're doing is we're saying you, you need to have time to observe and support each other because that's what professionals do. You need time to be able to develop yourself as a professional and you know, all of the things that Miriam has just talked about. Um, you, uh, you, know, you then can be trusted to deliver the outcomes that, that you know, we're paying you for, which you know, in the end is the transaction attached to the school funding. The direction of travel at the moment, I'm afraid, you know, if I look at the current um, review of initial teacher training that's going on, they're talking about essentially dictating how teachers are being trained according to the view of what they think in the Department of Education is the right way, which is in the end, probably, you know, the, the universities I talk to who are currently teacher training providers are talking about withdrawing from doing um, initial teacher training because that is impinging on their academic freedom. It's, it's catastrophic, the current uh, idea and the current centralization of things and the distrust of professionals. And if I, if I look around the world at the best performing education systems around the world, there's lots of difference and you know, the context is always different, but the sorts of things that are uniform are professional, the professionalism of teaching and the way that teachers are trusted as professionals and, and supported as professionals. And then 
normally there's there's more of an equity in those societies now we, you know we can come back to equity and poverty and the things that we we discovered about that during the pandemic but yeah right at its heart let's have a mindset sh shift which says yeah we'll trust teachers for a change uh, Lord Knight, I think something that happened on uh, Wednesday sums that up perfectly, and I completely agree with you. Uh, there has to be fluidity going forwards, not which, which sort of box we put in front of another box to get somewhere. So Wednesday, as all colleagues may be aware, and international colleagues may not be aware, was a universal thank a teacher day, which was a, a wondrous thing. The DfE's resource kit pack for schools to support uh, uh, thank a teacher day came out at 2.40 p.m., that day with, with anything from with anything from 15 to 45 minutes teaching time left in the day to reflect on it and i think that kind of sums up exactly what uh, lord knights just said that was part of the well-being strategy uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I really like resonate with what's just been shared though because i think in a lot of schools that, that i've encountered um where there's been more success in reacting to the challenges of the last 18 months it has been where the trust has been put that, you know, no no two children are the same. And the only people that really know the children and the best way to deliver a learning experience is the person front of the class and actually empowering teachers to take risks and try things and adapt based on their own confidence levels and the young people in front of them is far, far more effective than some one size fits all prescriptive approach. Couldn't, couldn't agree more and, and perhaps typified by if you're trying to deliver a, a wonderful blended hybrid learning, uh, I, I suppose the national expectation was, as you say, our, you know, one size fits all. But the the intrinsic challenge of delivering quality remote learning to four year olds versus sixteen year olds is 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 a you know a multiverse apart, isn't it? Uh, but that assumption from that strategic on high position was well, we've mandated you to do it, and if you don't do it, we'll be tied. No. I'll, I'll add to that as well. I mean, talking about making things prescriptive, it was it was a wonderful gesture to have a company such as Oak Academy be available. Um, you know, teachers never have enough hours in the day, so having additional resources would never be looking a gift horse in the face. However, I would say that our teachers opted out of using it because our students know their teachers and responded to them, be them, you know, whether it be online or whether it be in person, they know the nuances of every child that they are catering for. And I think that was, that could be something that's dangerously overlooked by just throwing out a strategy and saying it's online and everybody can just get on with it. There are the nuances of knowing the children, even when you're using the technology to make it best to meet their needs. And I think that was something that as a school, I was really proud of the staff who decided they weren't just going to take the lazy option and set and work all on Oak Academy because it's there. But it's nice to know it's there. You know, but they also have, they still retain that passion. And we wanted learning to continue. And for us, this all this talk of learning gaps and, you know, massive gaps in lessons, we felt the gaps were actually quite negligible because learning continued. Thanks to the technology, learning continued. Yeah. And uh, Miriam, I'm, yeah, the mention of, of Oak, you know, it was a heroic yeah. effort to get it up together as quickly as it was. And, and again, clearly it's being used. Yeah, it's still being used uh, heavily, and and that's great. But it is only broadcasting learning; it's not interactive learning. And we know that that interaction uh, between a teacher and a learner is is core. So, you know, well done to the team, and that they deserve the plaudits that they've got. But we shouldn't hold it up as being this, you know, pinnacle of ed tech and you know great achievement. It was. It was a stunning achievement to create a sticking plaster. And, and we now have some models of some good lessons for people to look at and, and maybe reflect on professionally. But it's it's a poor substitute to interactive learning. I mean, Lord Knight, don't, don't you think for a moment that uh, if history played itself differently and without it becoming a, a political comment, that if there'd been a slightly different direction in educational development and policy going back 10, 15 years, we probably would have had a national digital repository of, of learning resources probably by now anyway, because it would have been the right and proper thing to probably have. It, it's an amusing provocation, Peter, but um, <laughs> yeah, sadly irrelevant. You know, when um, in 2010, I'd 
one of the things I was most proud of when, uh, as education minister was a, a digital access scheme where we managed to get half a million kids who were offline, online at home, uh, which because of austerity was canceled. Now, if that hadn't been canceled, I think we would have had, we wouldn't have had the digital divide problem and we would have had teachers much more competent about how to use technology uh, and, uh, you know, we all know, and Miriam's a good example of schools that were already kind of up to speed, and you, you know we've all talked about them, and they were able to do a pretty smooth transition. There's a whole bunch of schools for whom it was really clunky because they had to, you know, work really hard to to catch up, and maybe we wouldn't have had that. But that's not where we are, and you know, people vote for different politicians to make have different priorities, and and we all accept that, and and that is that's life. Thank, thank you all. Thank you. Moving, moving on a little um, and having reference to curriculum providers or uh, sort of online lesson providers, I'd love to ask the question, how ought our curriculum to adapt? It's a very broad question and, you know, we can't influence policy, but um, I suppose in terms of pedagogy, how do we adapt? What works better potentially online? What works in the better face-to-face? Just some, just some thoughts from you. Uh, well, I, yeah, I'll start because I was the last one to finish, and then and then I'll shut up for a period. Um, the my sense is that the the accountability system, particularly at secondary, particularly um, with the eBag, is. Right, it's just not fit for purpose anymore. Um, that we have a disproportionate, slightly ridiculous obsession with solely the cognitive development of children when it comes to what we measure in accountability terms. Now, yeah, the professionals who are out there doing the job are also trying to develop children's social, emotional, and physical um, development as well, uh, but. We don't reflect that really in the curriculum and we don't reflect that really in what we measure and what we hold schools accountable for. And that has to change. Now, I'm lucky enough to have a go at being able to influence that. Uh, you know, I have in the past and I've got a private members bill just going into Parliament at the moment in order to put climate into the core of the national curriculum, because I think uh, it's urgent, given that children are going to be leaving school into what is significantly going to be a net zero economy and society and they need a different mindset and different set of skills linked to the knowledge that they learn in the curriculum to be able to prosper and thrive in that now that's a, an obsession about of mine that i won't dwell on um but yeah i would hope that we can change the curriculum on that but you know we have we have a national curriculum that doesn't apply to so many schools because they're academies, except for the, the English and maths one, I would like to see some of those schools use those, those curriculum freedoms a little bit more than they feel able to do, um, to push back a little at the accountability system by taking some risks and maybe taking some risks together so that they're not quite so exposed, so that they can then deliver more of what people came into the teaching profession to, uh, you know, to do, which is to develop strong, healthy childhoods for the nation's children that equip them really well to prosper in a very different world, a world that is de-skilling so rapidly. And yet we have an education system that was set up for a set of skills that now we don't need anymore. Yeah, it has to change. Yeah, I, I really uh, resonate and come off the back about what Lord Knight's just said. I think, I think it is about adapting the curriculum through uh, research-led evidence of, of where you think things may go, giving those freedoms. And I think it's trying to, the analogy I would say is we, we, we need to take ownership of the bowling alley and take bumper bars out of the, uh, the rails, because at the moment we're bounced between a performance accountability framework and a an inspection framework. And I'm not going to use the O word because it's not about talking about one methodology, but that risk, the risk taking element, which absolutely as aspire to and try to do wherever we can is sometimes hemmed in. And I think you're right, uh, Jim, it's about those empowered to do so from whatever type of school organization you're in to say, this just feels right, this is what we need to do. And again, 
you know, we've, we've so many reference points back into to history, haven't we? You know, I remember watching uh, those video sequences, Shift Happens, about, you know, we're teaching children stuff that's irrelevant because, you know, they'll be working in low earth orbit, they'll be designing new pharmaceuticals, they'll be doing all kinds of things that we can't even imagine right here, right now. So a sequential fact-based curriculum isn't much use if you need people to be very flexible and adaptable, and they'll change their careers dozens of times in their life now. I would really agree. I think it's, it's difficult following those two answers for their completeness. I absolutely resonate with uh, what can be perceived as a, a narrowing of focus if, if the, it's all about filling the buckets to meet your EBAC criteria and so on. And I think obviously we've been amplified a bit recently in terms of making sure that we understand that some of the things lacking in terms of visibility have been those more the, the experiential events for young people and the drama and the sports and the music and the other activities which you know, all resonate with the idea about breadth of education and that being the key. But when we talk about the curriculum, you know, and I, I would not profess to be um, an expert on the subject, but what I can look and say is we know in terms of that continuous journey that we have into the workplace that there's a, there's a very rapid change and adaption in terms of the skills that we need for our future workforce. And it seems logical that we need to think more about the skills as much as we do about the, the, the content and knowledge acquired to make sure that young people are, are, are fit and able to actually um, take that forward. And, and I think there's, a, there's absolutely a discussion there about surely we need to be thinking about the, the curriculum content and the, and the skills that we need to be giving young people that will be suitable in what seems to be an ever rapidly accelerating um, change in terms of workforce needs. I, I think that's really critical in tying it to what what the workforce needs, what employers are looking for in terms of skills for future workers is, is also very relevant. Um, you know, and we can go back uh, a couple of decades at least, uh, more than a couple of decades at this point, given that it's 2021 to when we were talking about 21st century skills and, uh, and needing to be able to measure students on, on uh, things that were beyond, you know, beyond facts and really looking at more skills-based. I've, I've found that like uh, looking at the ISTE standards for students, framework. Um, if you look at that framework, it's a great framework. Uh, I'll put the link in the chat there. But it's a great framework um, to think about the non, you know, fact-based skills that we need students to develop um, as modern learners. Um, but to the earlier point, like, we don't necessarily have a framework to assess against these skills. It's not how, you know, students are graded per se. Um, and so how do we actually incorporate not just the teaching of these skills into everything we're doing, but but really transform the assessment to also look at these skills. So it isn't just, you know, the asking them questions that anyone could look up on Google, which is how they will do it when they get in the workforce, when they're asked a question, <laughs> you know, and instead the next steps that go on to collaborating with their peers to create new and synthesize new knowledge. That's great. Thank you. Would anyone, anyone else, else like to jump in or? Okay, I think, um, so what I'd like to do is ask another question, and, and that is sort of thinking about some of the, the, some of the concepts you talked about. How do we keep accessibility and inclusion in mind during learning design? And inclusion in its broadest, broadest sense, I suppose, from students who find it difficult to access learning, just uh, either through, um, through sort of their own individual challenges or, or, or because of digital challenges? I think, well, I take a, sorry, go ahead. Go for it, go for it, Al. I, I was going to take from, a, from, from, from the digital, the technology side, which I think is probably in this conversation, one of the, the lesser in, in terms of the importance rating. But I think it does absolutely feed into the context, which is um, co-production, this sense that the tools need to be shaped and defined and created based on what's actually needed in schools and in the classroom. And we need to have a, a cr closer alliance that we're actually developing tools that actually um, will have impact and they can be subsequently evidenced. And so I, I think we're already seeing that, you know, and, and the UK has got a thriving technology industry working with, in many sectors with schools. But I think there's still that disconnect that we need to make sure that there is a greater educator voice around the table when it comes to the design of solutions. Now, which solutions we choose comes back to that broader conversation about, you know, how do we actually develop that accessibility and inclusion? But we've, we've talked about the, the, the digital inequalities, 
But we also need to make sure that the technology that's put in place is a level playing field for all of our learners as well. I, I really agree. I really agree with that, Alan. To go back to something Lord Knight said, I think we can build on that because I think we'd be very hypocritical if we didn't use the following phrase. Why don't we also ask the learners how they would like their accessibility to be? Otherwise, we end up with a proto world like the DFE telling us all what to do at the moment and not necessarily having the answers. So I think it's a combination of what you just said, Al, but actually listening to the end user as well because we might actually learn something by asking how they prefer to learn or how they would like to access content. And as we have these amazing digital tools, it's less onerous now to create content in a multitude of formats than it may have been a decade ago. I wanted to talk about accessibility in terms of accessing technology, period. Um, you know, we introduced ourselves and I said I'm passionate about reducing and re reversing disadvantage. Um, the challenge of ensuring that every child has internet access, let alone devices, is real. Um, you know, there are a number of things that, like, like us, I'm sure many schools were doing, chasing the DfE for those laptops, which came not necessarily in a good time, but they came and you were able to distribute them to children. You know, almost a quarter of our children are disadvantaged. We didn't get enough, um, and we're still trying to find creative ways to ensure that all our families have accessibility, having to put in place a prioritization exercise, you know, which families come first. The DfE guidance changed the three times. It started with the year 10s, and then 70 to 11s, and then 7 to 18, and each time we were navigating how we would make sure every child had a device. I would really like to see the UK or the world think about how every child, it should be like um, child support. There should be a sort of internet access up to the age of 18, which is just available for those families with children up to the age of 18, broadband. So that that is a completely eliminated concern or worry to access information. That's what I would like to see. And I think it's really important that, it, it's all very well to the device, but it's important to think about how will they use the device and access the devices. And personally, I remember getting a Vodafone email and, the, and it said only the head could apply for these additional SIM cards. And there I was furiously typing to my desktop. I couldn't type quick enough. There were only 50, but they were 50 that were going to go to 50 families. I needed to get the access to those. Yeah. I'm certain, like me, many heads around the country were doing the same thing. So for me, that's a real, that's a real barrier before they can even access getting a device. Let's make sure they're on the internet. It should be free for children between the ages of zero to 18, I think. I agree totally, Mary Matt. I think, I think actually collectively, uh, not using the we for perhaps the discussion we're having, but I think we missed a spectacular opportunity to, to achieve some of that perhaps levelling up because obviously we'll all remember some of the studies and, and Lord Knight will probably know the precise metrics on it about the cost of being digitally excluded uh, for accessing public services and so forth. It's a great drain on the, you know, the, the welfare state and the economy. Yeah. If, if there'd been the opportunity to provide a device and some access to those disadvantaged households, not just the educational advantage suddenly, but the economic and the socio-economic advantages would have far outweighed a £300 device that was massively overpriced to begin with anyway. There was a chance there, wasn't there, to actually you know, create a very strong level playing field, albeit for a short period because devices fail and drop off the end of a cliff. But there was a chance. Yeah, I mean, that... So my, my recollection of 10 years ago, 12 years ago, whenever it was, was that the average household back then would save uh, £213 a year on their bills just by being able to pay for them on, you know, pay online rather than using paper and so on. And we kind of, for those of us who are on the right side of the digital divide, we kind of forget that we do all of those things without really thinking about it and, and how much money it saves us to be able to shop around, to be able to um, switch providers of electricity and so on. And time. Um, so those those things are, yeah, and time, absolutely. So those things are all real. And, you know, I'm now chairing something called the Digital Poverty Alliance, which is bringing together commercial interests who've got skin in the game around trying to build the market for online tools um, and educators and so on to, to think about uh, what a, a new home access program would look like. And, you know, Miriam, I would love to see certainly every tenant who is in uh, social housing 
um, to have connectivity just there provided as part of the deal of being in social housing so that they are then included and then you know the device issues can then be solved um, I think relatively easily but it's those families who have had to choose between food and data uh, during the last year that you you know that, that we really need to have in mind and then the other thing that I would say Sarah would pick up on something that Peter said earlier which is you know if we could have a digital mindset around this, by which I mean, you know, if you're developing a digital product, then you obsess about what is the user experience and what is the user journey um, for your thing that you're making. Well, we could do that with education and we could do that with really thinking about the diverse range of different pupils that are learners and, you know, where they're coming from, the different levels of disadvantage, the intersectionality of their disadvantage, and think about what those barriers are that are getting in the way of their user experience as a learner. And that mindset as to how you develop digital product would mean that we're creating learning that is as engaging as playing Fortnite or <laughs> you know, whatever other computer game, FIFA, whatever you know, your computer game of choice. Yeah, we shouldn't be trying to pull education and learning out of those games, but we should be inspired by those games that are so engaging for young people and create learning that, that is on a par um, and, and borrow some of the technique. So focusing on, I agree with all of that, and focusing on student connectivity is something that we started doing 10 years ago uh, over here in the United States, and now we work with close to 3,000 school systems uh, across the US and Canada, as well as uh, a handful as we've gotten started over in the UK to support schools there. Um, and, uh, you know, we've worked with state level governments and federal government here to, you know, put focus on this, right? So the, in the US, we now have a $7 billion funded program specifically to ensure students have connectivity and devices. Um, you know, so it's, it's, you know, there's a lot of, of uh, you know, government resources being put to that right now. But this focus on the homework gap has been going on for many years here. And so the part of what Khajiit views differently about this, and Miriam, you mentioned it's not just getting the access, but it's how they use it. You know, it, that's also very important. So what, what we have focused on is we would love for every household to connect themselves, to just have internet access, you know, on their own. But from a school's perspective, if the family hasn't been able to do that, uh, you know, for whatever reason, um, socioeconomic or otherwise, the student needing to be connected to maximize their educational attainment is really key. And the school wants to provide access that is educationally appropriate. So we focus on partnering with the schools so that we're connecting students, whether it's a, you know, a, a laptop that has connectivity embedded in it, you know, like an LTE embedded, you know, Chromebook or something, or it's a hotspot based solution, or it's, you know, a fixed wireless solution in the community, but that that connectivity is also safe and secure so that it you know protects those students from harmful content on the internet there's cybersecurity elements in there and that we can help schools understand how are students using it when they get online what educational resources are they gravitating towards and are they things the school prescribed or are they things the students self discovered to help inform the educational practice of the teachers um, you know that's also very important so i think it's it's not just kind of connecting them to the internet, which there's lots of commercial solutions to just connect them to the internet, but it's doing it in a thoughtful way. I'd, I'd like to I completely hear what you say. And I, I met with somebody from Kaji, and what I loved with the concept of the organization is right. It's heart is in the right place. And you've got an organization that's thinking about the accessibility of children in schools. Why not working with schools to get you know, to allow them to do this. During the lockdown, I remember, um, obviously, many schools had their vulnerable children coming into school um, because either, for whatever reason, but if they didn't have the internet at home, certainly that would have been a good reason to be in the school accessing learning. And the beauty of having live lessons meant they could be in a classroom, and so would their peers be in online, but nobody would know that they were in school, really. It wouldn't matter. They could tune in at the same time, in real time, be accessing the delivery of the curriculum in exactly the same way their location might be different, but it didn't matter. Um, so yeah, I think it's a brilliant idea that Kajit has, has thought about allowing connectivity as well, working with schools. And just just to um, name check, Michael, you've, you've put in the 
chat the details of a grant that is open at the moment. Do you want to talk about that very briefly? Yeah, Mir Miriam brought that back to mind when she was talking about frantically applying to get some of her students connected. And, <laughs> uh, you know, we, we actually do have a digital inclusion grant program um, that's running right now. Um, and I, I put that in the chat earlier. I'll just pop that uh, in there again. But, um, but it closes July 5th. So I'm <laughs> sorry for it maybe to be a frantic uh, timeline again. But this is a pretty simple one to apply for. But as we're growing, as we're taking everything we've learned in the United States and Canada and bringing that over to the UK, you know, this is a way for us to just help, you know, schools get started, um, you know, understanding how to build a connectivity program um, that is education focused. Um, and so I encourage folks to, to go and uh, apply for those uh, while that application window is open. Thank you very, very much. Al, did you want to jump in on this part of the conversation? I think I've probably um, the focus bit that I was talking about was really about that that shaping and that production of yeah. it. And I think I think the inclusivity part we've we've recognised sort of sits at all levels. Uh, and that again, I think, comes down to the fact that we need flexibility. I, I also think when we're talking about all the choices, there's a potential when it comes to technology that that the choice becomes the barrier. So actually, the onus is to look at ways that and tools that we adopt that are agnostic as possible because we know different learners work and access through different types of devices. Uh, one of my roles is chair of an alternative provision um, academy. So for learners that, that perhaps struggle with the, the traditional mainstream pathways. Um, and actually the, the, the access of technology and the delivering of some of the learning online has actually resulted in greater engagement. And we've actually found different ways that resonate with the way that they, they see it more as an experience than the black and white sense of learning. And so, again, I think we have to be really mindful of the fact that what we want is the ability to flex and adapt. And the, and the choices of when we flex and adapt need to be in the hands of the teachers um, in response to what they know triggers best with their learners. So what we're trying to get down the line here is let's, let's put the connectivity argument as a given. I think everyone's on the same page so that we want to have that equality. But beyond that, we want choice and flexibility to use what's right at the right time but also have the opportunity to evidence and make sure that we're we're using the right quality and the most accessible solutions. Yeah, and and I guess there may be a place for some intervention if there are some circumstances and some some pupils that are that are not being catered for by by the market and the products that are out there. You know, if there are aspects of SEND that need some you know some some of the commercial providers need some some nudge, some incentive yeah. to develop things and adapt things to make them more accessible for for others. Then we should do that. And and finally, we shouldn't. Yeah, it's really easy given the numbers, the disproportionate numbers of disadvantaged pupils who've have really struggled through this period to forget that there are some learners, as you say, Al, who have have prospered in with any time, any place learning. And, and some of those have um, SEND and um, and we, we shouldn't go back to where the way we did it before and forget that about those that have prospered in this. We, you know, we need to hang on to what worked for them as part of the diversity of the approaches that we have. I agree totally. We, we run the risk of disenfranchising them if we revert back to a traditional model. It's paradoxical almost, isn't it? We need to capture the best, yeah. the absolute best of what works. And that yeah. wasn't always the, the most expensive solution to the problem either. Yeah. Um, fantastic. Thank you. And that feels like a really sensible place to start to draw us to a close. Um, thank you very much for a really informative hour and thank you to everyone in the chat who has added so much value with suggestions and and we really value that interaction and that's what makes the education community and the BET community so important and with that at 5 p.m on a Friday afternoon in the end of June I would like to thank you all for your time and uh, wish you the very best for a, a happy weekend and uh, we look forward to seeing you on another webinar soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Take care. Bye.